future of the LEV Foundation? I mean, if you were looking a few years out. Yeah, so I've learned not to look too many years out. I certainly believe that we have a good case for continuing these robust mass rejuvenation projects for a while. You know, we don't know how long it's going to take before we reach that threshold that I defined as to adding an extra year to mean a maximum lifespan. It might, it might happen the first time. It might take two or three. Um, but however far we get, there will still be value in keeping going. Uh, we believe that the group we're working with at i are the go-to place in the world to be doing this. And, um, you know, we're the only people who are doing this really courageous stuff that inv where most of the interventions need to be injected and so on. Um, so, yeah, I think that's going to be our flagship program, probably, well, certainly for the foreseeable future. But yes, absolutely. We definitely want also to get going on other stuff that we believe is neglected. Um, we still think there's not nearly enough work on the extracellular matrix um, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, the changes that happen to it post-translationally because, of course, there's so, such slow turnover. Um, uh, there's going to be things that turn up that we believe, uh, um, you know, are, are appropriate for our pioneering heretical uh, status in the community. So what do you see as, like, the, I guess, the, the most interesting technologies at the moment? I mean, th there's a lot of them that you're looking at, right? But uh, the ones that are going to make the, I guess, the biggest change in longevity in the near term. Well, of course, um, the first question is, are we talking about mass longevity or human longevity? Uh, human. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so for human longevity, the current situation is, I believe, that we have a 50% chance of reaching longevity escape velocity within the next 15 years or so. I, mm -hmm. I, you know, people, 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 people watch my predictions and they'll come back and say, you know, you were saying 15 years a year ago, so surely you ought to be saying 14 now, you know, as if it was that accurate. <laughs> Um, uh, which is a little bit amusing, but you know, it's yeah. probably it probably is less than, 14, than fifteen now. It's probably thirteen. Um, but uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I um, I I think that's the kind of time we're looking at. So the question mm -hmm. really is, what are we? What can we expect the trajectory to be before we reach longevity escape velocity? And the mm -hmm. answer is rather dispiriting. That I believe that even when we're only you know a few years away from LEV we're probably not going to have actually seen very much at all. We might have extend, we might see a few years of additional life among people who are getting the state of the art therapies. And that won't be a very high proportion of people because the therapy will only give a few years. And so they, you know, they'll be expensive because they're new and so on. Um, uh, so yeah, it's gonna be a very sudden you know, step change when we hit this thing. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, there are similarities with the technological singularity such that, in fact, um, one of my friends a number of years ago said that we should call this point the Methuselahity, the point <laughs> where we reach our density escape velocity. Yes. Yeah, you can see that it's going to suddenly um, accelerate as you get closer. But um, And also, initially, it's going to be like the, the, the guys with lots of money who are... Well, that's the question. We don't know that. Right. And in fact, I'm very hopeful that there will be a very, very short indeed period when these things are available to some people, but not to everybody. I mean, to mm -hmm. everybody who's old enough to need them. The reason for that is because these therapies are going to pay for themselves so incredibly fast at the national level, economically. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to think in terms of government doing the right thing and being terribly humanitarian, which, you know, sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Um, you don't even have to think about the electoral imperative that, you know, poor people have as many votes as rich people and, you know, you won't get elected unless you have a manifesto commitment to make these things globally available. Um, no, you just think about the pure mercenary economics. The amount of money that the Western world or even the developing world spends on aging, on the health problems of late life, vastly exceeds everything else that is spent on medical care. Mm. Just because, you know, the health problems of late life are chronic and progressive. So you end up being sick and expensive for a long time. Um, so, um, yeah, therapies that stop people from getting that way are going to, it's going, the investment in those therapies is going to be an investment that pays for itself very quickly indeed. So all we need to actually do is get the people who make decisions, the policy makers, decision makers, to understand that logic sufficiently in far in advance. So this again is anticipating the anticipation I was talking about, but it's mm -hmm. also anticipating the actual arrival of the therapies. Um, so even if you had maybe five years 
in advance, but I prefer it would be, would be 10 years, um, to plan for this, you know, and to front load the investment into training of medical personnel and building of infrastructure and changing of regulations and so on, you know, then we could go from zero to, not, zero to infinity, not zero to one, um, very quickly indeed, you know, from, from these therapies being available to anybody to being available to everybody who's old enough to need them. Right. And certainly you would think with the, like the lowering birth rate in many advanced economies, uh, keeping older people healthy and maybe in work would be attractive to politicians because they, they have to worry about the public debt and so on. Yeah. So, of course, that, that's something where culture matters an awful mm. lot. Yeah. So, you know, in Japan, they've they, they got, they got this terrible worry about the declining population and no birth rate and everything. And yet it's politically impossible to change the rules on immigration. Right. You just mm -hmm. can't, they just don't want, want to have it happen. And in France, you've got this, you know, millions of people demonstrating against changes to the, um, the age of the state pension, things like that. Um, you know, different countries have different um, resistances, but they're not always the most rational. Yes. No, I would agree with that. What's your overall kind of estimate of the, or view of the longevity industry right now? I mean, th there's uh, Altos Labs and uh, Calico is kind of quiet recently, but, but Altos Labs has made a, kind of a big splash in the last year or two. Uh, do you see that as being like a step change as kind of moving things forward a lot? Yeah, there's been a number of step changes. Um, so first of all, there was the arrival of the private sector so 10 years ago there were, well, yeah 10 years ago there was no private sector at all it was all academia and basically me you know and well there was sense research foundation and there was the buck institute and basically nowhere else outside of universities um and um then you know suddenly a few people started to uh come in in the private sector calico started in i think 2014 and it doesn't really count because it was very clear that they were going to take a long view, which is what they, by which they meant they wanted to call it a company, but functionally it was going to be a charity. It was going to be just, you know, the, the, the pet project of Larry and Sergey. Um, and they weren't expected to make any money out of it before hell freezes over. Um, and yes, I, I don't know why they even wanted to do that. You know, they've never given Sense Research Foundation or Larry B Foundation a penny. I think they basically just are the kind of people who believe that nonprofits are not efficient um, mm. entities when it comes to pioneering technology, which I think is nonsense, but you know, you can't change a billionaire's mind very easily. Then um, the uh, adventure um, mm. sector came along, uh, starting with Laura Deming's Longevity Fund in 2013 and following with uh, Michael Grieve and Jim Mellon and people like that in 2016, 2017. And so that, of course, has exploded. There are now lots and lots of venture funds and masses and masses of, start of small startup companies, a few of which have now got to the point of actually going public. Um, but, um, you know, there's still a, long, a lot of growth to happen there. And that's fantastic. There's plenty mm. of money coming in. Um, there's still a problem, which is that a lot of the work that needs to be done is... Um, let's call it pre-investable. It's just too early or early stage for people who want to make money soon to feel that it's right for them. Mm -hmm. So Altos, as you say, came in, and this was Bezos basically taking the same view that Larry and Sergey had taken. He didn't want to fund charities. He'd, never, he'd also never given us a penny, even though I was I started to educate him about all of this in back in like 2006. But at least he's put proper money into this now. And they've done it in a very interesting way. As you say, they've made much more of a noise than Calico. Um, and they've, 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 they've hired a lot of very top professors mm -hmm. and they have not stopped those professors from going out and giving talks. I'm pleased to say that one of the top ones, Steve Horvath, is coming and speaking at my conference in August, oh. this, in, in, in Ireland, August 17th mm -hmm. through 20th, which was announced yesterday. But so, yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful that Altos will really move the needle, will really do a lot of good stuff with that enormous amount of money. Then, of course, on the non-profit side, there's Hevolution, this foundation that was created in Saudi Arabia, um, which is funded by the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, and they are claiming that they're going to spend a billion dollars a year. Uh, mm. They are not spending that yet by any means, but they're, they're spending a little bit, and they're ramping up. Um, and I'm talking closely with them as well, and I'd like to say that they seem to want to talk to me, um, mm. so that's all good. 
One thing that absolutely must be emphasized is the impact that's been made by the wealthy people in crypto. Um, so, of course, quite a lot of people have made money in crypto lately, and the great thing about them is they have two characteristics. Number one, they are geeks, so they understand you know, engineering and uh, the, the kind of way that I describe the problem of aging and how to fix it. And number two, they're young, by and large, mm. which means that they haven't you know, been ground down by failure. They haven't lost the ability to aim high. Um, so a number of these people have started putting really serious money into the field. A couple of them have done so in the forms of companies. So Brian Armstrong, who started Coinbase, started a company called New Limit. Um, Charles Hoskinson, who created Cardano, and was one of the founders of Ethereum as well. He created a clinic in rural Wyoming, for whatever reason, um, that's an anti-aging clinic. Um, uh, but uh, a lot of the people who've been getting involved have been doing so purely philanthropically because, you know, they feel they've got other ways to make money. And as I say, they, you know, they, they still have their humanitarian hats on. Um, so the first of these was Vitalik Buterin, the creator of Ethereum, mm -hmm. who um, started donating to Sense Research Foundation back in 2017, as soon as he got into a position to, you know, to have a, a substantial amount that he could donate. He's been extraordinarily generous in keeping this work going. And then there are a few more that came along this past couple of years. Um, one of the founders of Ripple, a guy named Jed McCaleb, who, uh, for largely through luck, I think, uh, managed to hold on to a vast amount of the, uh, a, a good proportion of the wealth of the money he made, despite the crypto crash, because he converted it to dollars at the right moment. And then a guy named uh, Juan Benet, who created Filecoin, uh, and another guy who was a very early uh, in, um, investor in Ethereum, a guy named James Fickle. All of these people have put eight-digit money into the field over the past um, over the past two years, and it's really made a difference. Okay, so is there anything that I should have asked you that I didn't, do you think? Um, well, let's see. Um, of course, it's important that you should put the website of my foundation oh. in... Um, well, of the course. LEVF.org. We have a nice friendly donate button. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I mentioned earlier mm -hmm. that these experiments that we're doing, that the flagship program are very expensive and we don't yet have enough money to be able to um, kick off the round two that we would, mm -hmm. uh, we would like to do in yeah. October. But apart from that, yeah, I mean, certainly the conference is very important. Yeah. If you go to LEVF.org, that's the thing at the top of the page now. Uh, mm -hmm. But it, uh, the second of the conferences that we run in Dublin, uh, which is a lovely place to have a conference, especially the kind of conference that I run, which places great emphasis on the recreational aspects, so the networking and so on. Um, you know, it's very much a party town. Um, and uh, so that's in August, September 17th to 20th. I've got the most illustrious speaking roster you've ever seen in the entire field. And um, yeah, that's a place to be. Thanks. Other than that, obviously, uh, our website is the place to go to keep up with information that we will be putting out very frequently uh, with updates on the programs. So, um, yeah, that's really it. OK, excellent. Thank you. Yeah, I look forward to you having a newsletter because I would like to subscribe to that. Uh, OK, thank you so much. Yeah, OK, bye.